This podcast was sponsored by Latinas and Power. You know, the other day I went to this networking event and we were going to talk about how Latinas can level up their career, our businesses, and how we can build financial literacy to build wealth in our families. And by using our experience as superpowers and this Latina that was sitting next to me at the table, you know, she leaned over and said to me, I don't feel like I belong here because I, I don't know, listening to everybody else, I, I don't feel accomplished enough. You know, how many times have we heard that or told ourselves in rooms of power? I eventually said, you belong here. So Latinas and Power Corp is an organization that has been bringing Latinas together for over 20 years. And now they have created a Latinas in Leadership Institute, Lily, a women's leadership and advocacy certificate that is designed for early career and mid-career Latinas in the workplace and in businesses. So if you'd like to learn more about Latinas in Power, go to latinasinleadershipinstitute.com and download the report the Latina Pathway to Excellence in a Post-Pandemic World. This is our time to lead. Gracias. Welcome to Latinas from the Block to the Boardroom, where wisdom comes from everywhere. This is a podcast about generational wisdom shared to help build a bridge for future generations and to build stronger communities through education, technology, and health. Welcome to Latinas from the Block to the Boardroom. Hola, amigas. Before we get started in today's podcast, I just wanted to let you know that we recorded this episode this past summer when the Women's World Cup was happening in Australia and New Zealand. And at the time, we were discussing how brands, advertising dollars, and TV networks were tracking the viewership and advertising dollars of women viewership around the globe. However, there's been new data since then to support women's sports, which will be listed in the show notes. And one thing is clear, the opportunity to invest in women's sports is now. Why? Because with the advent of streaming apps, YouTube, and social media, we can see everything in real time or get the highlights of us playing in some of the biggest arenas in global sports. You could say that the Women's World Cup that just happened, and most recently, the WNBA, which is really taking off here in the U.S., has really put us on the map as far as women's global sports and the revenue that is being tracked with significant growth. We definitely have been showing up in bigger numbers, and a recent stat that I found posted that as June of 2022 to June of 2023, there has been a 22% increase in the number of females aged 18 to 24 who have been visiting a sports website or app more than any other age or gender that they've been tracking. That's big. This is happening as women's sports are becoming more mainstream and with new leagues, more investment and increased screen time, we're unstoppable. Why? Because we buy the tickets and we schedule the activities We buy the gear because we want to look good. We want to look cute. LFS recently stated that we're having a watershed moment in sports and it's time for us to invest because we are changing the dialogue on how we want to spend our money. Now, with women's flag football now being added into the 2028 Olympics, I can't wait to see what's going to happen with Latinas in sports. So let's welcome Karina Martinez, the co-founder of the first platform for Latina sports called Drafted, where she is harnessing the power of Latina sports fandom, where more people can feel seen and heard in the world of sports. From the heartbeat that pounds through the stadium arenas to the muddy fields and playground courts with no nets. She's helping fuel the heroes of yesterday and are steadfast in finding our future heroes in sports, Latinas today. 
Welcome, Karina, to Latinas from the Block to the Boardroom. I am very excited to have you on this podcast because of this year of sports, in particular for Women's World Cup soccer. There's a thread, but we're excited to talk to you about not only just women in sports, but the changing narrative and effects it has on Latinas and women of color in general globally. So welcome, Karina. Thank you. I'm excited. I know we've talked before about sports, but I am so excited to talk about sports and everything in between and uh, looking forward to it. Yeah. So as I mentioned, we come from two generational backgrounds, right? You started your first company under 30 years of age. It was a PR company called The Havana House. And you had some pretty awesome women that you represented, which are doing very well right now, right? One of them being Sandra of Nopalera. There were a few others. I think also Kayla Castaneda from Agua Bonitas, who is also on this podcast. We just finished the recording on Tuesday. Oh, my God, we got into it, man. We got into the weeds. It was awesome. It was a great conversation. So... Having two women with the name Karina and Kayla recording in the same week, (laughs) get a little tongue tied. So let's just kick it off right now with where are you talking to us today from and where did you get started? Like, tell us a little bit about your journey here in California. Yeah. So I'm speaking from Los Angeles, Pasadena specifically, where we and my fiance live. But, you know, I always say that my life has been kind of in this living in the hype. And what I mean by that is I was born in Asuncion, Paraguay, and then adopted when I was about a year and by Cuban immigrants. So was raised as basically a Cubana, you know, grew up eating con cri and listening to Celia Cruz. So very much in that first generation immigrant household. And then we were raised in Orange County where we grew up first generation. My sister's also adopted and she's from Russia. So a lot of the United Nations in our home. But I grew up in Orange County. And after school, I was really eager to kind of make an impact and got diagnosed with ADHD in my mid-20s and just learned that I was incredibly unemployable by three jobs that did not go very well for very long. And that was kind of the point in which I thought, okay, I've had three jobs now in less than a year. I'm on my way to be the most unhirable person with this resume of like three to four months and bullet points. So I have to kind of start fresh and take a step back and kind of learn and figure out what it is I wanted to do and fell in love with stories, fell in love with the impact stories can have. And I'm sure we'll talk more about that. And that was kind of the idea in starting the Havana House and really about the stories that reflect my upbringing, being a person of color, being an immigrant, being queer, being Latina. And those who are innovating, you know, within that culture, I think, are the ones that are making change. So that was really what the Ivana House did for a little over five years. And the name was even an homage to my family, who is Cuban-American. Um, and they were raised in Havana, Cuba, and then immigrated here. So it had a lot of those roots around really amplifying our stories. And that's kind of what has helped catapult what I'm building next. I love that story. And, and why, I mean, just from your perspective, why is it so important about these stories to be told? I mean, seriously, like, We all know, oh, it's history. Like we want, why specifically? Like that was your mission. Like there is this calling, right, for you, which is for me as well. So I want to hear your side. Yeah, I'm like, I mean, stories for me are the beginning and the end of change, right? Personal level and anecdotal level, like we hear stories about people and then that makes us kind of make change in our own life or make decisions in our life. But from a larger impact standpoint, Specifically with media as a PR agency, media has the opportunity to shape culture. You know, we we see the beginning of culture started through movies and through the books that we read and through actual traditional media outlets that are telling these stories. And they're the ones kind of rewriting or writing the way that we think about ourselves, whether as women, people of color. That rhetoric is so important. And so for us, it was really important that we become the advocates for these stories to be able to be seen in the same places that their white counterparts are at or to be able to kind of take back some of those narratives. And you know, and so for us, that was the beginning and, and why those stories are so important, because 
whether you're a venture capitalist looking for opportunities, you're reading Forbes and you're seeing Latinas, brown women innovating through culture, raising millions of dollars and your eye turns to them as an opportunity, or you're a young girl who dreams of being a doctor or a CEO and she sees, you know, brown woman or a person of color in those positions and she thinks I can do it too. So there's a lot of reasons why stories make an impact. And so that was kind of our hope and what we wanted to do with that. Right. And, you know, you really touch on a very important piece about media and being represented in these spaces, especially online, which is the whole, I want to say, conviction behind me coming from tech, because ultimately these stories, the narrative, the pictures, the words, the search, everything gets compiled into this sphere uh, of, of, you know, where am I? Where do I fit in? You know, identity. And it's beyond social media, right? It, because it's all connected. So for me, coming from that world and also what you just stated, not seeing very many Latinas, you know, women of color, or just in general, our communities in leadership roles that are very important to what's changing the world, specifically technology, this was a big concern to me, right? So I feel the universe has put us together in a way to have these conversations and to share strategies and perspectives because I know there's more, but it's how we're using our voice and our platforms to really elevate and help educate more folks about this narrative and how technology is really playing a part in, I want to say, I mean, this is my perspective again, in manipulating the media narrative to say, this is what we think they want, right? Lumping us all into one big, I want to say one big brown perspective where it's a lot, right? And John Leguizamo even came out with his series to talk about it. We're looking at the same path, like we're here, you know, we're here together, right? So what I want to do now is I want to talk about the startup conviction. So let's start with your startup conviction, right? You talk about your, you know, when you started the PR firm and now what's your new platform that you're going towards now? Yeah. So I recently co-founded a company called Drafted, which is all about elevating and celebrating Latinas in the world of sports. You know, our mission is going to be about creating that change and really reshaping, to your point, uh, what Latina and sports fans even look like. You know, we want to take back that narrative and show that we are no longer an accessory in sports, but vital. And we're going to do that in two ways. You know, we plan on really leaning in on, on content and creating that community for that person to see themselves and give us that trust and that opportunity to engage with her. But the bigger opportunity we see is really in, in building out a data-driven platform so that we can make some of these big-time decisions and we become a real business case, you know, where we can take that to, to big leagues and partners who need that data. And it's no longer about doing the right thing, but it's about doing the thing that's going to make you the most money. And the reality is Latinas are the ones making that change. And so that's kind of the overall goal uh, that we're going for. Yeah. I mean, we are an economic powerhouse, right? And and we keep hearing that and saying that, but Latinas really control the household income of purchasing for the kids, for the food, for, you know, many things, right? Even though there's shared opinion about that, maybe to some cultural degree, but the Latinas at the end of the day, they put their chancla down and things get done in the house. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say. And they're the social calendar, right? Which is usually where our dollars go. So if we're speaking about specifically and her and her friends and or her you know neighbors want to go to a baseball game she's the one that's going to check to make sure that the game you know what time the game is what gear we should buy you know are we ubering or are we taking the train like those are all economic decisions that most likely if you live in a latina or non-latina household she's going to be the one making it and so to your point we are not only an economic powerhouse because of the volume of people that we have in this country but because we're the social and financial decision makers at home. Exactly. So let's get into the Women's World Cup because it's very inspiring to me to see how far that sport has come, not just from the United States, but also just to see globally, it has been a global sport, people, before it hit the United States. And specifically in the Central America and in Mexico, which if you all know your history... 
this is where it originated, right? So I'm very shocked to not see Mexico in this Women's World Cup, but there were many reasons for that. But the thing that really intrigued me most about this World Cup is from 2019, I actually saw one in 2015, which was in Vancouver, Canada, and the amount of soccer moms, I'm just going to put that out there, soccer moms that I saw looked nothing like my family, anybody else's family. And I'm like, wow, you know, like uh, this really big question mark in my head, like, why aren't there more Latinas playing soccer? Where are the Latinas and the Latino families, you know, supporting it? It's like, well, they're in the global community, right? They want to see it on TV. They want to see it, hear it on the radio. Yes, they go to Telemundo to hear it in Spanish. I mean, there is a huge community. And if Colombia did not solidify your conviction of Latinas from a community that was ranked the one of the lowest, the least amount of funds, and politically what's going on in that country to play against the most elite teams in the world. I just got goosebumps right now saying all of that. It's like, I mean, I was like, I wanted to be in that stadium. That's how powerful it was for me being an older Latina and for you and the advertising dollars that went into this arena was incredible, right? I'm getting goosebumps, like just talking about this whole thing. It was so powerful. And I know I'm talking and I'm ranting here, but I want to get your perspective on the Women's World Cup. I want to be clear about the missed opportunities here in this global women's sports arena that I saw with my own ojos. To your point, I mean, this World Cup to me meant everything. I mean, I grew up playing soccer. So obviously from a fan perspective and from an athlete perspective, I just remember watching it as a kid and seeing, you know, very little fans out in the, in the stadiums. And, you know, my chances of going professional were like slim to none. But I just remember thinking if I if I ever made it, who would watch me? And that's devastating. And to see these stadiums, like plural, with thousands, 70 plus thousand people in a very remote country, right? And I can't even imagine what that would look like if it was in Europe, where it was a little more easy to access, or even the United States, kind of more centralized. I was in awe, first of all, for myself as a fan. But I think to our point is like, it is so beautiful to see the globe come together for sport and the globe to come together for women's sport, because that seldom has happened. And not only is that an emotional thing, but it's broken so many records that at this point, I hope that we have gotten to a point where we are an economical decision that is going to make a large impact, that we are we've made so much noise that we cannot be ignored. And, you know, I think that the world is starting to come to that realization, even though we've known it for a long time. It's taken, you know, all of these years of advocacy and and really starting to break some of those records and barriers so that we're no longer ignored. And obviously, like for me as a Latina, it's so beautiful also to see that the way that the diversity in the teams are coming, the opportunities to see Colombia make it that far and to see even non-Latin teams like Nigeria and Morocco make a stand and be a competitive you know, nation is, is also something that is so, so refreshing and beautiful to see. And so I'm also going in circles, but, you know, I think this is what I hope to be the beginning of a non-ignorable movement for us as women and women's sports. Oh, yeah. No, I think I'm just going to take it maybe again in my own perspective. It's taboo. It's taboo in a way that and I'm just going to throw this out here from a perspective of mine that happened to me is there's Barbie and then there's soccer. Now, when you put those images in your mind, right, what do you think of? Now, my mother told me when I was wanting to try out for the varsity team in high school, she was like in disbelief. And she told me, and this is cultural and, you know, I forgive her. We love each other. It's not a big deal. But it was an opportunity to see that I'm going to, I know my power is that She said, young ladies do not play sports in high school because that was her generation, because then it meant you were going to be classified 
as the other at this time before, you know, everybody right now we have so much freedom to come out. Right. But I knew where I stood in my sexuality. And I said, what? And she forbid that. And I didn't have my own money at the time. Let me tell you, that plays very much a part of what's happening today. Money presents opportunities. It doesn't mean wealth. It's opportunities and what you do with it. So anyway, I'm just saying that there is a narrative that is culturally dominant about us talking about if we want to be Barbie girls or whatever, why can't we be part of the sport as well? And why is it classified that if you play a sport, oh, you must be a lesbian or testosterone infused or whatever it is, like stop that shit. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's one of the things that we're learning and we are having so much fun exploring is that fandom is a, is a spectrum, just like how we you know interact with our own culture as a spectrum. We have folks who are bilingual and we have folks who are who are not and doesn't make us any less of a Latina. And whether you're a star athlete or just like to wear the jerseys to the games because it makes you look cute, you're a fan no matter what. And it's about really recognizing and honoring wherever you land in that fandom. And there is no one right way to be an athlete. There is no one right way to be a fan. It's But it's about, especially for Latinas who have been ignored in sports, who have been told culturally that it's not a place that they should be, it doesn't make them more ladylike or appealing or it takes away their sexiness, whatever that narrative is that we've told, you know, it's really about making it a place that's so welcoming that we can be ourselves and we can be feminine and sports fans. We can be Barbie and an athlete. Right. I'm I'm hearing in the back of my mind that Barbie will come out with a sports Barbie. I'm now, I think I've put it out there. <laughs> and let's just talk about that for a second, because that's a narrative that takes investment in right changing these narratives does not come free takes money to support and like i was saying earlier money presents opportunities it's an opportunity to lift others right so just to give you an example i'm going to bring some facts in so i was looking at the advertisement spend on fox because that was the american tv distributor for the women's world cup at three o'clock in the morning but they sold out all their advertising slots. They made over 50% more revenue than 2019, which is a record. And other brands missed opportunities, they said. They're renegotiating the women's sports contract for CBS now to get involved. It's still nothing compared to the men's advertising revenue that was through the television, which was $350 million. And, you know, we barely cracked over a hundred million, I think it was, but it doesn't matter. It's the gap is shrinking. A, B, contracts are being negotiated for a bigger viewership. And I'm just going to throw Telemundo in there too, is that this was the first year ever that they've had 90% women broadcasters in the Women's World Cup to be throughout the globe for the Spanish-speaking communities. Women were presenting all of the communications except for one guy, right? And I watched it, and it was amazing. They were the Barbies on the television talking sports and stats in high heels, okay? And I was like, this is badass right now. You know, this is cool. (laughs) So, I mean, it's changing, right? I mean, you go from one to the other, but that's Telemundo. So why does this matter? Why do you think this matters in comparison to what you're doing? I mean, seriously, you're onto something. I know that this has been a gap. And we always talk about how do you fill a need and a gap? And you've obviously found one. So let's put the Women's World Cup into perspective for all of this into what you're doing. I don't know if I'm trying to shove a an alligator into like a baby shoe here. But, you know, <laughs> I mean, I think something like the Women's World Cup is pivotal. I mean, like I said, it's it's on the global stage and it can't be ignored. It's going to help us catalyze this conversation around the importance of women and Latinas. And the reality is that we cannot amplify Latinas in the world of sports without talking about all of the people and all the Latinas that are make the game actually happen. While the fans are pivotal and in, in showing up and making that impact, It's about the players 
It's about the broadcasters. It's about the commentators. It's about all of the women that make that happen. And so for us, like we're looking at the World Cup as a little bit of a case study of our own to be able to say, look at the way that the world is rallying around women and Latinas and like the Colombian teams and specifically because they came so far. And so for us, this is an opportunity to really start to understand what that fan is looking for. And it's giving us leverage from a data perspective around everything you just said to say that this is where the movement and the, and the growth is happening. And it's now time to add, you know, some of those dollars and some of that strategic planning embedded into that. Yeah, for sure. And you know what was cool that I saw on television in case you all weren't watching this at three o'clock in the morning or if you recorded it and watched it was you saw the young kids in the stands and they were young boys and girls together, you know, like supporting the teams and the communities that really show up for, you know, this sport. It's a global sport. And that's what I love about it so much. And one of the things I, I want to ask you is knowing that, right, how do you feel that you're going to bring more of the global community, especially women, Latinas, uh, voices into this platform? Like, what are you tracking or, or what is it like investment dollars? Is it just sports specifically? Is it a combination of both? Is it like, what is it exactly? Because I'm curious. I mean, I think what we're learning is that the solution is so nuanced. And I think we've touched on a lot of points, right? I mean, it starts from the very beginning, from being young girls and the investments emotionally and financially our parents make into the sports that we play or don't. And then what teams and what where we live and also the emotion and financial support that we're getting on the field in coaching and all of these things, you know, and then there's the the recruiting and all the different layers to get to that professional point. And that's just to be a player, right? And we're then we're talking about fans and we're talking about the actual sports industry. And so what we're learning is that there's so many different layers to to this problem. And the reality is that we as one company can't fix it all. And it's going to take things like the World Cup and other people to, to find their place in this world to make an impact. But I think where we're starting is really, really focusing on the actual Latina who is involved in the world of sports, whether she's loves to wear the jersey because it's cute or whether she's front row spending all her money uh, to be that fan and that, you know, that star player and using our culture is that through line to galvanize and to make that connection to and in hopes to normalize and rewrite what a Latina and what a woman in sports looks like. And so what does that look like from an actual platform perspective and for what we're building and drafted? You know, it looks a couple of different ways. And to be fully transparent, we're only a couple of months old. And so we're really in that early stage of, of learning and understanding and creating a, a space because what we're learning is that Latinas who are in the world of sports, who, who are fans, don't even really identify with the word fan because they've been so ostracized that the word fan doesn't even always feel like it's relatable to them. You know, a fan often comes with a certain narrative or a certain level of expertise. And so I'm going backwards, but what we're really focusing on is, is one, learning what it is that this person really needs in order to feel important and can really engage and spend those dollars in the world of sports and then using that learning to create some sort of platform. And what we're leaning towards is really building, really building something that's community forward so that Latinas can engage and see themselves in all of the different worlds in the sports, whether it's a fellow fan, whether it's a place to be able to play soccer safely without men and without some of those toxic narratives that exist in sports uh, and really create that safe space so that from a business perspective, we can understand and, and really gather data when she trusts us and be able to make strategic long term plays in order to build a better world for her. Yeah, that's awesome. I love that. And, you know, just so we're clear, we're not saying there's no Latina fans in sports. We're not saying, oh, this is going to, you know, open the gateway. Like, no, we know that they exist, but we're talking specifically of a community that culturally, like you just said all the points. You just said all the points. And I have to go back to my mom a little bit. 
She is the biggest Raider fan. That woman can nail down stats, football stats from like the 70s. She can name the quarterbacks. Listen to this. When football season comes, she watches the draft and she buys the red zone. Okay, so she can watch five games on Sunday, people. This is crazy. And she didn't want to let me play soccer. I mean, this is nuts to me. But whatever. We all live our lives. And I love her for that because I get all the lowdown on football, American football, NFL. American NFL is just getting to like, oh, there's female fans because you see them now in commercials and at the parties and, you know, they're starting to make outfits for them and same in baseball. But when we're talking about a global sport, because baseball is a global sport, but there's women in baseball are just starting to bubble up. Soccer is so much bigger and it's always been talked about. But again, when we talk about dominant narratives, squashing what's really out there, this is what we're talking about. Like, and as the hashtag was for women's World Cup is, you know, play until they can't look away. And that's what we're saying here today. That's going to be a hashtag in, in the show notes. And I mean, seriously, there's, I mean, I'm getting goosebumps again because this sport is so near and dear to my heart. And I mean, I like, I wish I could start. I actually was able to kick a soccer ball again and I haven't done that. And it was just really weird how it came to me. I won't get into that story, but it was weird. And um, yeah, it was it was very like, wow, something's talking to me right now. So Karina, leave us with something that, you know, what can we do to support you? Where can we find you? Like, like I want to support this. What can we do? Like, what is it? Well, I mean, first of all, tell your friends to to uh, follow and be a part of the drafted community so you can find us on TikTok or Instagram at We Are Drafted Co. And as far as what this community can do for us, I mean, I think it's really about it being a two-way street. We want to hear from other Latinas who love sports, who are thinking about loving sports, who are diehard fans. We want to hear from you. We want to know what it is that you want as a fan or as an enthusiast and where it is that you feel is one of the biggest gaps that we can help kind of fill because it's going to take those conversations since we've been so ignored. We want to hear from you to understand how we can continue to make this a place that feels safe for us. Yes, absolutely. And again, we share the space through the interweb. So the louder we get and the more we show up and that's just not here. This is like in everything, right? Movies, publications, I mean, everything. But this is a global stage, people, through the Internet. And I think our minds, like when we just think there's a whole world out there, how connected can we be? How much power can we draw into a collective space? It's massive. And I feel like I saw that in this World Cup, like that I have not seen. And I've been watching them for years, like seriously amazing. I'm very excited for you, Karina. And we're going to have to stay in touch because want to know when you get the big partnership and you know all that stuff comes down because I sense it I'm visualizing it now for you so <laughs> all right well thank you for joining us today on Latinas from the Block to the boardroom thank you for having me gracias Karina for joining me today on Latinas from the Block to the boardroom if you'd like to learn more about Karina and Drafted you can go to their website at wearedrafted.co that's wearedrafted.co if you'd like to connect with her on LinkedIn you can find her at Karina Martinez and you can also find her on Instagram at wearedrafted this podcast is supported by Latinas in Power a network of thousands of Latina professionals and entrepreneurs from across the United States that are ready for leadership opportunities. Join today or inquire about their Latinas in Leadership Institute at latinasinleadershipinstitute.com. Production and design for this podcast is by Teresa E. Gonzalez, founder of 5E Leadership and Marketing, audio engineering and design by Robert Lopez of Crates Audio. For more information about this podcast or sponsorship opportunities, go to info, I-N-F-O, at 
latinasb2b.com and get in touch with us. And please follow us now on YouTube. We have a YouTube channel at, you guessed it, Latinas B2B. And follow us on all our social media handles at Latinas B2B. To stay current on our events and workshops, don't forget to sign up for our newsletter at latinasb2b.com. Gracias.